All right, so that was We Love to Boogie with Dizzy Gillespie and John Coltrane. Yeah, man. See, it, he's playing that R&B style, but it's still got the bebop in it. And you hear already his tone really coming together. It's starting to sound pretty unique. It's starting to already sound like him. Uh, very precise. Uh, uh, but you can still hear Dexter in there a little bit, right? There's a little bit of shake on the tone and the full-bodied nature of it. Got the glassy stit on tenor thing. And uh, it's already departing from everybody's other idol, which is Lester Young, where they're kind of already doing more bird's take on Lester than Lester himself, even though Lester's the giant. Right. Yeah. So he's playing with Dizzy. He's, they're doing this kind of thing. Um, but Dizzy's also, I mean, is Dizzy now full-blown bebop guy, or is this prior for him, too? Well, this is 51, so Dizzy's actually already becoming at the height of his fame. Dizzy's, a, I guess he's going to be appearing, he's already appeared on the cover of Time Magazine with the beret, you know, so he's, he's the face of Bebop right now, not Bird. Bird's already squandered his opportunities of, um, of, of uh, being the poster child for the music. You know, he's just too wild, he's too hard to pin down, so Dizzy's the man. And Dizzy's, Dizzy's a great got, entertainer, right? Right, and he dances on stage, and he's yeah, he's an entertainer. There's singing. Dizzy's already bringing in the Cuban music, is already and congas is already coming in. So the mambo craze is going to be centered around Dizzy and Tito Puente, and that's all coming from Cuba, Puerto Rico to New York. You know, Arsenio Rodriguez's sound, and but they're going to turn it into New York jazz mambo. And Dizzy's the poster child for it. So now Dizzy, Dizzy was never a heroin addict. Dizzy's at the height of his fame, and and he's already been on Time Magazine uh, with the beret. He's the poster child for the music. You know, not Charlie Parker. He's kind of already squandered his opportunities to be the poster child of of the music. And Monk, of course, is not has yet to be on Time Magazine. And Monk's still a very much underground figure, as much as he's the uh, pint, the grand. <laughs> the grand poobah of, of bebop is actually Monk. Bird's just the, the horn player that plays it the best. Um, and now Dizzy's got this big band that he's starting to tour around. Uh, um, Billy Eckstein toured the, with bebop in the during the war, but there was still a prohibition on recording, and the music was too early to go down south and play for blacks who were more into blues. And so the bebop of the ex legendary Eckstein band was too perplexing. So you wanted, by the time Dizzy's doing it uh, six years later, the audience is a little more ready for it. And Dizzy's a great entertainer and dances on stage and there's singing and there's congas now being added and the mambo craze from Cuba, Puerto Rico to New York, Tito Puente and Tito Rodriguez, Arsenio Rodriguez, the pioneer of the whole sound. And the music, you know, the Machito and all that stuff's coming in through Dizzy. Dizzy's like this very important person across the board. But he's not a junkie. He never was. But you have this whole band of younger brothers who are growing up post-Charlie Parker. They idolize Bird, so they're all starting to do dope to be like Bird. That's one of the horrible legacies of Bird is that all these people thought if, if you want to play like Bird, you got to do like Bird which laid waste to a whole generation of people wasting their time on being addicts. You know, it's a terrible thing to be addicted to that thing. Now, at this time, was, was Coltrane already beginning to experiment with drugs? or? What, yeah, what? Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy Heath and Train were, were running buddies, you know, and they got busted together and fired together from Dizzy's band. And uh, I'm sure that goes back to the R&B Philly thing. I mean, you know... It, in the, we're talking about early 50s. We're talking about late 40s. And like Ray Charles and being in, in that scene, that, that R&B, blues, jazz scene, a lot of the young people uh, did heroin. That was, a, that was, there wasn't really cocaine to be had back then. That was, the drug that you did was heroin. And, wow. and uh, the older generation drank to excess Right, swing juice. You know, Coleman Hawkins is smashed on every session. He sounds great. I, he plays unbelievably well for somebody who's so loaded all the time. But uh, you know, most of the those generation of guys drank themselves to death. Somebody like Louis Armstrong was blessed because he was just a 
heavy uh, pot smoker. <laughs> so I spared him the, the liquor thing. and the, But when Bird comes in, it sets everybody up for, for heroin. And, uh, you know, you're just going to go through go through all that that entails, you know, stealing stuff and, you know, being late for gigs and having to score every day and, you know, going through withdrawals, which makes you super sick. And it's a super horrible thing to go through. But yeah. it was, you know, but there's a there's benefits to it. I wouldn't lie to you. There's the high of it is a magic carpet ride and playing music on it is like you have so much confidence and everything's moving in slow motion. So if you practice a lot and your chops are up, it's a great assist to getting really deep into the sensuality of the music and stuff. And it can be uh, very alluring. All of a sudden you feel like you can't get to the zone without your little helper anymore. And now, now you're doing it every day. Now you're in that junkie thing. It's super hard to get out of it because of the pain and suffering of withdrawal. And you're trapped. And that happened to a lot of guys. And so Dizzy walked in on, on Jimmy and, uh, and Train shooting up, you know, probably for the 10th, tenth, ten hundredth time or whatever you want to call it, and, and busted him with needles out of their arms and, and got fired right there. So here's Train getting the gig with one of his heroes and getting getting fired for drugs. Right. So he goes back to Philly and kind of, you know, he always practiced a lot. So he's one of those guys who, and he's also a nice guy, a, a good human. So as opposed to getting like turning into a, a pimp or some really negative stuff like that. So, you know, he's still a earnest musician and a, and a spiritual guy and a, and a gentle soul. It's just the, the drug thing. Yeah. Yeah, well, we'll probably get yeah, we'll hear more about it as we go along, um, because you know that's part of the, the legend, the story of of his transformation and getting clean and all that. Yeah, he gets the gig with Johnny Hodges in '54, and Johnny Hodges is one of his idols. Remember in the interview when they ask him, who his favorite saxophone player is, he says all of them, and he probably means it. You know, he probably studies everybody, and they're all his. They're all family with him, and he's not going to pick and choose. He doesn't say anything about Bird, and very notably. I mean, it's a very, very obvious uh, glossing over of the, you know, the main man here, Bird. And um, so, oh, you, all of them, yeah, of course. But, but really, who's who's the greatest? Johnny Hodges. Train answers very quickly. Johnny Hodges. Now, that's an unlikely answer to the question, and especially to come right out of the gate so fast. Johnny Hodges. Really, Johnny Hodges, like the portamento, the, the sort of, you know, Duke Ellington's main guy. I mean, Johnny Hodges' time feel is incredible, but that's not bebop at all. He doesn't do any, he doesn't do any long linear playing. He doesn't really do any uh, um, super hip, uh, you know, flat fives and sharp 11 chords. You know, it's not really, that's not, it's not the thing. Why Johnny Hodges? And he very quickly answers again. He says, because he's so confident. And that's also an unusual answer. But let's 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 pick that apart. He's so confident. I think it's because Johnny Hodge's time feel is the best. Like that whole band, Duke's whole band is incredible. Like those brothers all have the best time feel. That music swings so hard it hurts. They play quiet and it swings like a crazy. And then everybody's sounding great. The band's swinging like crazy. And then Johnny Hodges comes in, and it's just like even next level. It's like a vacuum, vacuum seal of time field. You're perfect, you know. It's like Johnny Hodges. He's so confident. <laughs> yeah, when and when he comes in, it's just like it's suddenly his band, right? That, yeah, yeah, yeah. How does he do that? Yeah, you know. And, and he doesn't like get really get into the gears of the music with with eighth notes, you know. You know, he's not right with the drummer, you know, really working the eighth notes. He does it by, you know, like, what? That's amazing. And he does it with his vibrato and stuff, too. It's incredible. And he's like, when, when he plays the blues, it's just putting right. on a sermon. Now, one of the things, you know, that as we go in deeper uh, through the all the recordings and everything, I mean, Coltrane, we know the sheets of sound. We know the brilliant, blistering, inventive solos. But he also had a very romantic sentimental side that we hear in those ballads right is he getting something from johnny hodges absolutely that's right that's right because when when bird plays ballads 
you bird tips his hat to that side of it, but bird right away starts playing thirty second notes on ballads, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And Coltrane, when he plays ballads, he can do that too, but he he backs off and uh, he's playing in the upper register on the tenor, which on especially on ballads is where it's most noticeable. It's called. Um, well, I call it palm key singing, because on the tenor saxophone, to play those higher notes that you would sing the song on alto saxophone, you have to play them with the palm keys. They're on the top of the horn, not altissimo, but alt, you know, on the top of the horn where the palm keys are. And part of palm key singing is uh, aerating the tenor saxophone or aerating the alto. So if you're playing, what, what do you mean by that? Well, aerate. that's what that's what flute players are, do. In order to make the note in tune, you have to aerate, which is when you finger the note, you lift up one of the keys that helps it sing better. It 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 makes it not so stuffy. How does that sound? So when you aerate a certain note on saxophone, like if you played concert C in the middle of the horn, uh, first it's like one of the first notes with the octave key on. You play that. Concert C, they call it D on the horn. Um, it's stuffy. And if, but if you aerate it with the C palm key, concert C palm key, you, oh, 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 but just by putting, you know, so you're holding that note down and you're aerating it by raising up that palm key. It makes it, makes the air flow through the horn better. And okay, it's called so. Aerating. Right. And so it helps it sing better. It sounds more like a singer singing. So when Coltrane plays the palm keys, it's part of that aerating kind of sound. He also does these very detailed ornaments. So the way the notes are ornamented has a kind of ghostly quality to it. It's, it's subtle, and you don't realize that he's putting so much attention to that. That's actually where the focus is at. Wow. Now, never having played the saxophone, I've, I've learned something new today, which is... <laughs> aerating. <laughs> yeah. Aerating. And, and, and the use of those buttons, I mean, you just kind of assume that you got to hold that button down and blow to get that note. But well, you're but saying also, that there's, also, yeah, yeah. there's ways to slur and to, and to sh- subtly shift pitches and things by how much aerating you give a... a right. Well, note. there's really common uses of it that we've all heard, like in uh, early rock and roll... R&B tenor saxophone playing, which is pretty famous. You know, they do that one note thing all over and over again. You know, that's like, right. it's more of a rhythmic thing. Wah, they're wah, aerating. Wah, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're, they're aerating when they do that. You're playing ah. concert B-flat on tenor saxophone. They call it C on the tenor. I don't know why. But um, it's concert B-flat. The music's all in B-flat on that early rock and roll stuff. Because when you hold down low B-flat, you can play bop, you can play the low note, or you can play it just very easily with your mouth. You can play it up an octave. And then with your index finger on your left hand, you just go up and down on, on what would be B flat. Ooh-wah, 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 ooh-wah. It, another word for it is false fingering, hmm. which somebody like Mike Brecker uses a lot. Train uses it a lot later on, too, where you're splitting the fifths and the octave partials on purpose in your mouth and you're creating false fingerings. You guys, uh, guitar, string players do false fingerings, imitating horn players, where you mm. play, um, oot det, oot det, oot det, det, oot det. That's a classic Chuck Berry lick. Right. B.B. King yeah. does it too. You play, so, let's say you're playing A on the E string on the guitar, on the high E string, you're playing A, mm-hmm. and then you play A, you can bend up to A, or you can slide up to A on the B string. Ooh ah ooh ah ooh ah ooh ooh ah right and those are, you can go bado 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 those are false fingerings mm-hmm. and that's the same thing conceptually as what you're doing on saxophone uh, Lester Young was the master of it that's actually where they got a lot of false fingerings from originally was from Prez hmm. so yeah because I would have always assumed that those things were all being done with the mouth you know and and not so it's much a, it's a combination yeah it's a combo right. it's yeah. it's totally a combo yeah cool okay. Um, but he gets now the important thing to remember with Johnny Hodge, he gets the gig with one of his teen idols again, you know, Dizzy Gillespie. Now he's got the gig, you know, gets fired from Dizzy's band for drugs. Now he gets the gig with Johnny Hodges, his other idol, you know, three years later in '54. So things are looking up for him. Ah, gets fired again because uh, Johnny Hodges isn't a junkie. 
So trains late to the gig, showing up dirty, not washed, you know, wearing a wrinkled. You know, now Bird can pull this off because Bird's a, a genius, right? Bird would show up in a dirty suit, you know. Right, but Coltrane's but, just a working musician at this point. Yeah, he's not famous, and and he's not the fountainhead of the whole thing. He's just Coltrane. He, he's nobody. So here he is doing the bird routine. No, I'm not having it. You're fired. Wow. He gets fired from Johnny Hodges yet again. Mm-hmm. So goes back and works on the music again in Philly, and you know. So. And, so from this point, how does he end up playing with Miles Davis? I mean, how does that well, happen? I think. I think Sonny Rollins. I think Sonny Rollins was interested in going on his own, and Sonny Rollins. So Miles is clean. He cleans up in '53, I think. So by the time he makes that album with Horace Silver, where they play "Old Devil Moon," it got "Blue Haze." I think they got as one of the, maybe the more famous versions of that album. Uh, Miles is straight. And you could really hear it in his playing. It's like, you know, Miles felt pretty injured by his experiences in the United States. Uh, when he went to France, you know, he got a reprieve from the racism and the lack of respect here and fell in love with a woman and the whole thing kind of fell back on itself. He ended up back in the States feeling sorry for himself and going back into the drugs bullshit. And when he got clean this time, it... it now he wanted to make his mark. 54, you can really hear it on that album, Blue Haze, I think they repackaged it as. And, um, but Sonny Rollins is moving on. I Probably Stitt was as unreliable as anybody could imagine because he was a junkie and probably had his own possibilities of, uh, of his own career. And Miles wasn't really, uh, wasn't preordained yet that Miles was going to be the great Miles, you know. This was a comeback album for him. And uh, he's got his band in place with uh, PC. I don't think the piano chair was set yet. So he's and, he's uh, putting together he's a new got, band. He's putting together he, a new band. And most importantly, the super dynamic Philly Joe Jones. Philly Joe Jones... You know, the music's all going to be built around the drums because it's black music. So it's going to be built around the drums first and foremost. That's the most important instrument, truth be told, right? The drums. Yeah. And Philly Joe is, well, you know, also a lunatic junkie, but a very gregarious showman. And it comes through in his playing. You know, he's a very daring player, very charismatic, uh, dynamic, f- great at playing fast. Uh, also much more of a feel player. I mean, of course, Miles is going to like that. There's an element of in- the intangible feel thing. And, uh, you know, when they play fast, you listen to Philly Joe, every time that eight, every time the 32 bars rolls around or even an eight-bar cycle, you just can't believe he pulled it off. Yet again, he pulls it off. How, what is that? You know, and then it seems to, like, like reset itself up as he goes back into the, into the swing feel, the fast bebop feel. It really... Philly Joe Jones is an incredible, dynamic, uh, unique individual that really elevates the whole band. And so Miles is building it around him. Hey, who should I get on tenor? Well, there's this really original guy that maybe you haven't heard of. Uh, people in Philly love him. His name's Coltrane. Oh, I heard that. Kid, you mean the alto player? That kind of squonky alto player <laughs> trying to play like Bird in Hawaii? No, 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 no. He plays tenor now. Oh, he does? Yes. Let's give him a chance. All right, get him down here. And so they bring him down for rehearsals. And the famous thing that Miles talks about is Coltrane asking all those stupid fucking questions. Of, you know, Miles had potty mouth all the time. You know, Train asking because he wants to make a good impression and play the music right. And he's got lots of questions. And, you know, Miles doesn't like answering lots of questions. He's kind of a taciturn person by nature, I think. And maybe his voice being all croaked out from his failed vocal surgery. And, uh, uh, yeah, the rest is history. All of a sudden, Train's in the band. And now, what, what Miles liked so much about it was Train's unique altissimo playing, that palm key singing we were talking about. It's new. Uh, it, uh, Coltrane's not playing the sort of thoracic tenor, <laughs> tenor style, uh, uh, like Coleman Hawkins. Ooh, bah, 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 bah. He's not playing like Ben Webster with all the air. And he's... 
you know, Lester Young's starting to play that sort of where he hangs on the 13s and the 9s and he just hangs on those wispy notes and lets them hang all out there like dreamy and kind of romantic and wistful and kind of looking back and looking forward at the same time like only Prez can do that it's such a unique thing that he does and so you can see Miles's idols Bird on alto Johnny Hodges on alto and Lester Young he starts coming up with that high note singing and he's playing birds bebop language already like crazy like as far as 16th notes on medium tempos and the fast eighth notes that is bird 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 all the way that's bird's language and train's getting good at it he's a very methodical practicer but it comes out of him very lyrical i think when stitt does it it comes out like bird clone and I think when Sonny does it, you still hear a lot of connection back to his idol, Coleman Hawkins, who's also playing very mathematically intelligent, harmonically. But Train's ability to play Bird's language while being his own lyrical self is what makes Train... And that's, that's Miles' sweet spot. You know, the, the, the technical ability, the ability right. to play that language, yet bring something a little more sensitive or original, I guess, you know, and to the People equation. don't talk about this as much as, like, they, it used to be a really important focus, and it's definitely a very important focus for Miles, is how do the two horns blend together timbrally? That's a much more important uh, element in the decision of who's going to be the other horn player next to me. Not, is this guy great? Does this guy play this, you know, bring the heat and the stuff? And is he going to, you know be good for box office sales and this and that and the other thing. He's thinking about this guy's tone. And Train's tone is setting up Miles. And Miles talks about it. It was like that tone was different. And I knew it was going to be, I knew it was going to be huge. I knew it was going to be very influential. It was just going to take some time. That's how Miles talks about it. So Miles has that visionary belief. And then he can kind of surrogate and help the, help the guy in and navigate the showbiz thing. But it all goes back to that tone. And I remember um, I had a mascot for many years that would come to my gigs, and he was a, he was a legend in Boston. And we just called him Harold. And, uh, you know, Brother Harold. And uh, he was this old beatnik guy. And he knew everybody. He grew up with everybody. He was buying those bebop records when they came out. He called himself the Viper. You know, he'd show up at the gig. He showed up at everybody's gig. He knew all the jazz legends. And he would show up with a couple of pinner joints and some Vicodins, if anybody wanted those too. And very <laughs> hip old man. And talking to him for many years was really great because he got a lot of connection to the past. You know, he's really good friends with Jackie Byard, like family style, you know? Wow. And, yeah. uh, and um, uh, incredible stories. And so he, he had a story for me about, about Train that was incredible. He said he was at the record store thumbing through albums, looking for new releases. And there was a black kid thumbing through records next to him, in the aisle next to him. And he brought out of his pocket, you know, a sneaky Pete, a little half pint or a pint of whiskey, and hands it to the young man next to him, flipping through records. He takes a draw off it, hands it back. Harold takes a draw off it, hands it back. The other brother takes a draw off the little whiskey. And they're looking through records, and, and Harold says, what do you think of this new kid, Coltrane? In Miles' band, I, I prefer I prefer Sonny Rollins. I think Sonny Rollins is the perfect guy for the gig. What do you think of this new guy? And the and the guy looks at him and he says, "Well, I I think yeah, I think Sonny Rollins is the guy for the gig." And I think yeah, he's he's Sonny Rollins. He's the best, you know. Uh, but but I'm Coltrane and I, I have the gig now. I have to do my best <laughs> to, to play the gig myself. And it's just an incredible story, right? <laughs> oh my God! Yeah. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> and and the perfect Coltrane answer, humble. Oh, totally right, right. But also, but I, it's my gig now, you know. Yeah, you know, I, yeah. I got to do my best with it. What do you think I should do? That's <laughs> you know, great. Yeah, wow. I think that's a great story. Yeah. Now, so another thing, I, and I think we'll we'll hear this not to get ahead of myself, but you know, the the you talk about the timbre and all that. I think that's like you know, yeah, really important point. But also, there's Miles the storyteller, which is one reason he's, you know, the most popular jazz musician of all time. Right. 
and when he ends up with uh, Cannonball Adderley and Coltrane, you know, in the band, very different sounds. But I think he also liked the contrast. You know, you don't want everybody to sound like you, you know, and, and he was so good through his entire career, Davis, at picking those musicians who complement yet contrast and do the opposite, you know, don't have that same tone, doing their own thing and creating their own distinct voices. Like when you listen to So What, your first jazz album, right, and you're listening to it and you start hearing those differences <laughs> between, oh, there's a real different tone between these sax players. I'm beginning to hear the difference. Um, yeah. And and so, you know, Miles, I think, always was very sensitive to, you've got a quintet, you got to play together, but you also have to have these five distinct voices, the drums, the bass, the piano, everything. And he was a master of creating those blends that complemented and contrasted yeah. simultaneously. I think, I think he was at a point where he could afford to have another guy in the band and he can afford to have what would be another legend in the band. Because you still had to pay people like on retainer in a sense back in those days. You were like in the band, you know. Uh, it's not like now where everything's like, a, yeah, I don't know. It seems so ad hoc now, like mercenary style now. Back then, it was still like bands. You were, are you in the band? And then you got paid a weekly stipend. You know, right? You you got paid more when you worked, but you still got paid like a retainer. And I think uh, Coltrane. I mean, uh, Miles wanted to bring in Cannonball because Bird was freshly deceased. Bird was still casting this huge shadow, and Miles is like, not only do I have the vanguard on the tenor. Check this out. I got the vanguard on the alto. This ah. dude is take this dude is taking bird. Now bird's going to the next thing. This is 58 right on milestones. And there's some live recordings of the sextet. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. So Okay, right. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it was Easy my fault. Do. My okay. fault. But I just, you know, was think I just suddenly thought about that contrast of styles thing and yeah, and, yeah. and and that that's I hear that too when I hear Coltrane with Miles. You know, it's such distinct individual voices you know at the same time there's he's looking for that blend blend of the timbre and the tone like you're talking about so we get into these albums that were kind of recorded between what 1955 and 57 uh and they all have these great little titles like working and relaxing and steaming and 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 so this is kind of the beginning of 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 coltrane and miles's band so it starts off there's a couple of underground recordings for columbia where they're starting to put together the Round Midnight album, which is Miles' first album on Columbia. Miles was still signed with Prestige, which was not a very prestigious label to be a part of. Uh, you didn't get paid a lot. They didn't do a lot of uh, work in terms of um, uh, advertising their artists. You know, it was just sort of, you know, you play the session, put out a little record, and that's the end of it. Uh, so going with Columbia was going to be a big career boost for Miles. It's going to put you international. It's going to put you on a real major label, not just like this like fringe, uh, this fringe junkie label <laughs> prestige, right? Well, and, and with Columbia, one, he would remain for the rest of his life. Correct. And yeah. so it was a big deal, and he became one of their you know biggest selling artists. But they also had to make him that. And... Yeah. They had to sell that new band, and the new band wasn't totally gelling yet. And you can, so there's the, there's that little bit. But then right away they do the first session, and they're trying to finish. Miles is trying to finish up his prestige recording uh, obligations. You know, certain amount of albums. So they put out the new Miles Quintet. Well, how am I to know? Just squeeze me, Sposen, Stable Mates, and the theme. And, you know, you can hear Coltrane on. Uh, subtly on the audio asking for the beer bottle opener in between takes <laughs> so he's still drinking on the job so to speak you know and mm -hmm. the the miles quintet that quintet was known as the drugs and alcohol band because the you know uh, uh, aside from miles the whole band were, were junky booze heads <laughs> right the whole band wow and um but they were the best so <laughs> and Col Coltrane yeah. speaks of this this new Miles quintet session with some uh, embarrassment as if he's not really bringing bringing his A game to the session mm -hmm. and I can see what he means I still really like it a lot I still think he plays really well on it but there it could be 
it's not quite as good as he was capable of, and maybe that was because of the because of the uh, other things going on in his life. But it's still good. But it's not. Train speaks of it a little bit embarrassed. But that sets us up. That sets us up for the the massive session, which is I think just one or two days. They recorded four albums. Wow. And they named all the albums the same thing, which was working, relaxing, cooking, and steaming. Those were all recorded May eleventh, nineteen fifty six. How about wow. that? And then there's they they finish up the session in October fifty six with a few more tunes, and that's four massive albums. And that's that sets up our okay. Routine. So let's get into a couple of these cuts from these uh, early um, prestige recordings with John Coltrane and Miles Davis. And first up, we've got a famous song, Salt Peanuts off of Steeman. Uh, give us just a little bit about Salt Peanuts. Uh, the, well, the Salt tune. Peanuts is a whimsical composition by Dizzy Gillespie. It's kind of a whimsical vocal number. Salt Peanuts, Salt Peanuts. Uh, the reason why I picked it, though, is it really exemplifies Coltrane being able to kick some ass at high tempo. All right. All and right. so it's Bird, Bird and Dizzy's language, you know, F rhythm changes. And train is gonna just kick your ass. <laughs> All right, well, let's let's give a listen to Salt Peanuts with the Miles Davis Quintet featuring John Coltrane. 